I have no uh, financial uh, relationships and conflicts of interest. Uh, I will follow basically this outline uh, talking about the objectives of mechanical ventilation, the rationale for automated modes, the present options, and finally address the question of automated weaning. Some very smart people uh, believe that we are foolish to think about weaning, adjusting the patient to natural breathing again, that we just need to get the patient better and then extubate when they're ready to be extubated. This makes a lot of sense for many of our patients, but not for the most difficult ones. We need to withdraw support in a very careful way. Uh, and for this, automated weaning can be extraordinarily helpful. Does the weaning approach matter? The literature, as Hannah went through, suggests maybe no, not, not very much. Uh, a spontaneous breathing trial and minimal support then an up or down decision to extubate based on the spontaneous breathing trial BiPAP or high flow nasal oxygen if needed afterward. But I've been practicing almost 40 years now and I can tell you that my experience suggests yes, especially if the patient has cardiac issues, emotional issues, severe debility, uh, and uh, it depends on the caregiver experience and the attentiveness of the supported staff. I want to point out that there are emerging economic realities in all of our hospitals and all of our countries. We have actually fewer trained personnel per patient for observing the patient and for early intervention. We are demanded faster hospital throughput. And there is more demands for documentation, meaning less time at the bedside to observe the things we need to do. And in fact, the patient is rescued well often, but not stabilized or recovered well. And these are all stages in the process that we're talking about. So we need to have a very good way of surveilling the patient and intervening in a timely way. The key principles of ICU management are that therapeutic efficacy depends on appropriate and early intervention, and the clinician must wait and integrate all of the important factors with timely mid-course corrections. When we decide to do something and don't come back to the bedside to observe the results of our decision, we are not practicing well. Automated ventilation may help us. We need short loop feedback. We integrate information, we make a decision, and then we risk revisit the situation. This is, this is the way I think ideally medicine should be practiced. We have complex patients, there's a rapid pace of change, and early interventions pay off. Yet, in our current medical practice, the key drivers have been the high technology, that might help us, economic forces that tell us to get this patient in and out of the unit as fast as possible and make sure they don't come back, and our understanding of what the processes are that keep our patients chained to the ventilator is also very important. Sustaining a bedside presence is problematic for today's get to, uh, caregivers. Uh, maybe not in your unit, but certainly in my experience, this is true. We are pushed to make a decision and leave the bedside with sometimes an undertrained nurse or respiratory therapist attending to the patient and picking up the consequences of our, our decision making. Electronic medical records that have helped us in many ways, but they're also part of the problem because they encourage detachment from the bedside. Closed loop automation helps us stay vigilant and react quickly. This is something that we can really take advantage of if we use it appropriately. But the challenges for automated modes of ventilation is to integrate all vitally relevant information and to make adjustments in a timely fashion to correct the intervention paradigm according to the task involved 
and to allow the patient to accept the imposed changes by the automated mode. Integrating all vitally relevant information is key. Complex mechanisms, such as those faced by our ICU sick patients, often have more than one key element, and they need to be pulled together. I think we've been very naive to think that we can look only at the respiratory rate, only at the tidal volume or minute ventilation, and assume we know what to do in terms of extubation. We're usually right, but often wrong. The airway pressure, also, that we are talking about and, and have been using for, for many years, for frequency and tidal volume, for example, flows, etc. It only tells us part of the question related to the lungs. And this gets back to what Dr. Q. Mello had asked in the, in the, the Dr. Nau's uh, presentation. Is the trans-lung pressure important to know about? And I'll come back to that. Years ago, Francois Lemaire's colleagues showed us that if you look at the uh, esophageal pressure tracing during an attempted weaning in a patient with cardiac insufficiency, and many of our patients have diastolic dysfunction, for example, then you've, you detect that there's something desperately wrong with this patient well before they fatigue and need to be emergently put back on the ventilator. So we need appropriate reactive timing of our, our adjustments, and we need to be aware that even though something like the frequency to tidal volume ratio may rapidly change to a stabilized value, the patient may still deteriorate over a longer period of time. This is esophageal pressure swings over a 30 minute period of time in a patient who uh, eventually will fail. The frequency to tidal volume ratio is convenient. It tells us something quickly, but it doesn't necessarily tell us about the future time course. Potential applications of closing the loop by automation optimize our physiological targets, minimize our time, uh, time of support, and to avoid a synchrony ventilator-induced lung injury and unnecessarily high levels of supplemental oxygen. I don't have time to touch on this, but I think this is a hot topic at this conference and at others I've attended. We are probably ignoring some of the injury potential of the high FIO2s that we're using. Why is asynchrony between the ventilator and the patient important? Uh, apart from discomfort and physiological disturbances, possibly ventilator-induced lung injury and ventilator-induced diaphragmatic dysfunction, sleep interference, need for sedation, etc. Asynchronies during mechanical ventilation are associated with higher levels of mortality. So being synchronous with the ventilator is a a key objective in today's practice. Who becomes asynchronous? Patients with high, intermittent, and variable demands. And they can be generated by delirium, anxiety, pain, auto peep, secretion retention, fatigue, many factors. Asynchrony is almost always going to be seen if you look for it carefully. There are missed triggers, there's power mismatching, there's inappropriate off switching. And the fundamental problem we face at the bedside now, using the ventilator modes that are not automated, are that once selected, many ventilator setups adapt poorly to changing patient needs. And our patients do change very frequently. Our standard modes of ventilation that we've been using for many years, SIMV, pressure support, just control, pressures, pressure control ventilation, CPAP, they are not very flexible. Some of our newer uh, modes of mechanical ventilation that, uh, that Professor Arnal had spoken about do help with these adjustments. Our current appro approaches to automated ventilation are to let the patient determine the ventilation need, coordinate airway pressure profile within the individual tidal cycle, evaluate the breathing pattern primarily and the exhale CO2 and readjust to keep in the desired ranges. And then to accelerate the withdrawal of unnecessary support. That's our current way of looking at things. 
And we have certain modes that are definitely improvements on what we've been using for 30 years. Proportional assist ventilation synchronizes and mirrors muscular effort. For example, if we compare pressure control ventilation on the top with uh, PATH plus on the bottom, and we look at the patient effort in green, and we look at the applied airway pressure in red, which is time cycled here, we see that the same type of patient effort may be matched better when we use something like proportional assist ventilation, no matter what the pattern of breathing might be. So coordinating within uh, the cycle and between cycles, uh, again, Dr. Arnold did a beautiful job talking about smart care and adaptive support ventilation. Uh, these are modes I, I won't touch on because he did such a great job with it, but we do have better and more effective ways of uh, adjusting. The, funda the fundamental question I'd like to address is, can the patient and caregiver be trusted with control of breathing? And this is a very in incredibly important question. Can we judge or let the patient judge what they really need? Laurent Richard and others have shown that airway targets do not assure safe transpulmonary pressures during spontaneous breathing. Very forceful efforts may subject the diaphragm and the end lung to extraordinary forces. We do have tools to monitor the severity of the effort. Uh, NAVA is a very innovative mode of mechanical ventilation, but it also gives us something to look at, the electromyographic signal that can help us determine what the effort is of the patient. The esophageal balloon that, that we mentioned just earlier. Uh, I think this is going to be deployed widely in clinical practice because effort can be monitored by both the esophageal pressure and electromyogram. When you do that using an esophageal balloon, you see patient ventilator interactions that are not obvious by looking at the airway pressure alone. And if asynchrony is important, this is a way to look at it. We heard some beautiful presentations earlier in the Congress about ventilator-induced diaphragmatic dysfunction. Too much ventilator support weakens the diaphragm. Too little causes the diaphragm to, to uh, uh, have sarcomeric disruption contractile fatigue, and prolong our weaning efforts. Spontaneous lung injury, uh, when the patient begins to overbreathe, for example, in the post-extubation phase, it could be the reason for reintubation is that the patient is no longer able to control in a satisfactory way what they really need to smoothly come back toward health. So again, monitoring effort in things we haven't been monitoring could be extremely important. And it's been suggested that we should keep maybe diaphragm effort within a targeted physiological range, which we may be able to do even when the patient is extubated using an esophageal balloon or electromyographic signals. <clears throat> Integrative monitoring, not just of respiratory problems, but of the cardiac problems and of the mental problems that cause the need for reintubation is something some manufacturers are beginning to, uh, to address. I don't want to go into this in detail, but basically there are many variables to look at. And if we're so naive as to think that only one respiratory parameter is going to help us, it's a naive approach. We may be right, we may be wrong, especially if they have cardiovascular dysfunction. As Dr. Arnold said, is automated weaning superior to all depends? Is it the population, like Dr. Wunsch was talking about? Was it, what is your staffing and surveillance of, of, of your patients? How good is your implementation <coughs> of algorithms and weaning protocols? How good is your sensor fidelity of what you really need to know? Automated weaning is still incomplete. We need to look at transpulmonary pressure, adjust our timing, and look at cardiovascular tolerance much more closely than we have in the past. The p potential applications of closing the loop by automation are many. It makes perfect sense if we can do it right. 
to safely optimize physiological targets, to minimize the time of support in weaning, <coughs> to avoid asynchrony, villi, VIDD, and uh, excessive application of FiO2, cardiac decompensation, excessive work workload and distress, which is the reason why we need to reintubate our patients. And with that, I'll thank you for your attention.